Um, so I'm very glad to present this uh, work. Um, so I guess the story starts uh, a year ago. I wrote this uh, this paper where I uh, basically tried to um, do a topological inference for uh, Stiefel Whitney classes. So um, let me explain. Um, say you have a topological space X and a vector bundle on it. Um, a vector bundle on a compact topological space can be described by um, something which is called a classifying map. And this is a map that goes from uh, X to the Grassmannian. So the Grassmannian, uh, this is a, a manifold that depends on two parameters, D and uh, N. And um, so uh, if you have such a map, F, you can consider the induced map in cohomology that goes from the cohomology of the Grassmannian to the cohomology of X. And uh, there are some uh, particular uh, cohomology classes in the Grassmannian that you can push uh, with this map, F star. And that gives you cohomology classes uh, of X that are called uh, Stiefel Whitney classes. And these are uh, topological invariants of uh, vector bundles. And these are very interesting to, to, to study. Um, if you were to uh, compute uh, them in practice on a computer, you will need to have simple complexes, right? So you will have to triangulate X and uh, graph mine. And it turns out that um, we don't know uh, triangulations of the graph manion. I mean, uh, we know they are uh, triangulable, um, but I wasn't able to find explicit uh, descriptions, explicit lists of simplices uh, in the literature. Except for uh, the parameter d equals to 1 or a minus 1, and this corresponds to the projective spaces. So the next simple Grassmannian that is to study is this one, g2 of r4, the Grassmannian of planes in r4. And um, actually, this is uh, there are several instances uh, in topological data analysis where we are interested in such spatial uh, manifolds. Uh, for instance, this paper of uh, Polanco and uh, Perea, um, they use the fact that a Z principal bundle over a uh, topological space uh, is described by a map from X to some uh, lens space. And thanks to that, they design a dimensionality reduction uh, algorithm. So this is um, something we may need in practice. And I will present today a tool that allows to triangulate spaces. Actually, not triangulate, but uh, finding homotopy equivalent uh, simply short complexes, uh, which will be enough for us as we do uh, topology, right? And uh, all of this is based on CW complexes. So the talk will go uh, as follow. I will uh, first uh, describe the algorithm. So this is well known, nothing new here. I guess my contribution lies uh, in this second part where I will uh, propose some um, improvements of this algorithm. And then we will apply that to uh, the lens spaces and the grass manual. I will just put my chronometer to be in time. All right. So, um, what is a CW complex? This is, in some sense, a, a generalization of triangulations. So, a CW complex um, is a topological space, I call it X, that we endow with a partition in cells. We call these elements the cells, EI. And there are uh, three axioms. Uh, each cell must be uh, homomorphic to some uh, open ball of Rn for some n. Um, this homomorphism from the ball to a cell um, must extend to the closed ball. And so this extended uh, map is called the characteristic map. And if we restrict the map to the boundary of the ball, that is the sphere, uh, we call that the gluing map. And last axiom, uh, each point in the image of the sphere uh, must lie in a cell of lower dimension. So I give an example here uh, with uh, the sphere of dimension two. You can partition it in four uh, cells. You have 
one cell of dimension zero, a point, uh, you glue a circle, uh, a segment to obtain a circle, and then you glue two disks, right? You have a green map from the boundary of the disk to the circle, and you get uh, the sphere at the end. Actually, you can um, find a CW structure on the sphere with only two cells, one point, and you glue the disk on it. Right. So um, what is very nice with CW complexes is that they uh, allow us to describe spaces very uh, concisely. For instance, uh, the sphere, as I just uh, show you, can be described with uh, only two cells, one point and one cell of top dimension. And this is to be compared with triangulations. Uh, triangulation of the sphere, we will need at least n plus one vertices. Uh, for instance, we have the boundary of the n plus one simplex. This is a triangulation of the sphere. Uh, the productive space is another example of a CW complex with one cell per dimension. Though, if you want to triangulate the productive space, you must need a, a quadratic number of, of vertices, n squared, something like that. And we have nice uh, descriptions of Grassmannians, land spaces. Uh, a lot of CW structures are known on the manifolds. Uh, and actually, uh, most of the manifolds can be described by CW complexes. So we have a theorem um, which states that any topological manifold with a continuous structure only uh, is homomorphic to a CW complex, uh, except for dimension four, where we do not know if that works in dimension four. Um, if you are looking just at uh, a homotopy equivalent simulation complex, then uh, that works for any topological manifold, right? Uh, in comparison, it's much harder to find uh, triangulations of uh, topological manifolds. We know that any piecewise linear manifold uh, admits a triangulation, and uh, in particular, any smooth manifold, but in general, it's uh, complicated, uh, though any topological manifold is homotopy equivalent to a simplicial complex. And uh, how do we obtain that? We find a homotopy equivalent CW complex, and we turn it into a simplicial complex. And so this is what I'm going to explain today. Uh, the main ingredient of uh, that is called a mapping cone. So I will first define a mapping cylinder. Uh, consider a map, uh, a continuous map, F, between uh, topological spaces. I draw here a circle, and Y also is a circle, and you have a map between them. The mapping cylinder, so um, you take X product 0, 1. This gives you a cylinder and you glue Y at the end of the cylinder, uh, the one uh, part, uh, via the map F, right? And you obtain uh, this object, which is a topological space. And then you can build the mapping cone. Um, so basically, you just identify all the points of the, less, le, the left part of the cylinder. So this is a mapping cone. Uh, a result we will use later uh, if we have uh, two homotopic maps, F and G, then their uh, mapping cones are uh, homotopy equivalent. All right. uh, so why do we use mapping cones? Because CW complexes are mapping cones, or more precisely, they are uh, sequences of mapping cones. Let me explain. Um, a CW complex, we basically add cells one by one thanks to gluing maps. If I start with a point, I will have uh, a cell of uh, another cell uh, that I will glue to the point with a gluing map, right? And the union in X of these two cells actually is uh, homomorphic to the cone of the gluing map. And you can see that here, uh, if I glue um, an interval on the point, the mapping cone will be a circle. So uh, we have a way to build 
uh, topological spaces from their uh, CW structure, you consider mapping cones at each step. If you want to obtain uh, a simplicial complex from that, you have to triangulate uh, these mapping cones. So this is what we will do. Uh, the gluing maps, we will have to convert them into simplicial maps, right, between simplicial complexes. And this problem is called uh, simplicial approximation. And this is what uh, we're going to talk about now. So um, you can present simplicial approximation problem like that. Say we have uh, two simplicial complexes, K and L, and a map, a continuous map F, between their uh, geometric realizations. F does not have to be simplicial. And the problem here is to find um, a simplicial uh, map, G, that will be homotopic to F. We look for um, a simplicial uh, equivalent of F in a homotopy equivalent sense. And uh, to solve that problem, we have uh, the star condition. So I, I define here the star, the open star, and the closed star of uh, vertices of uh, the simplicial complex K. K uh, to the zero denotes the vertices of K. So I say that the map F uh, satisfies the star condition if for every vertex of k we can find a vertex of l such that um, the image by f of the closed star of uh, v is included in the open star of w the two bars uh, mean um, geometric realization uh, so i drew something here for instance we have k this is V, and this is the closed star of V. And this is the image of the closed star of V in L. And as you can see in red, this is contained in the open star of W. So F satisfies the star condition at V. If it satisfies the star condition for every vertex, we say it satisfies the star condition. And in this case, um, we can define a map for a G, for every vertex of K, choose uh, such a vertex W here. That defines a map. You can show that uh, it is simplicial and it is homotopic to F. And this map F is uh, G is called the simplicial approximation. Um, so the problem is solved if F satisfies the star condition, but this is not always the case. For instance, here, I have two simplicial complexes, and you can see that the closed star of V here, its image is not included in any open star of the codomain. And in this case, what we do is we subdivide, we refine, um, we complexify the first simplicial complex. And for instance, here you can see that now the map satisfies the star condition. And this is a theorem. Uh, the simplicial approximation theorem. If you subdivide uh, sufficiently many times your domain, your first simplicial complex, then the map will satisfy the star condition. And by uh, subdividing here, I mean applying uh, barycentric subdivisions. So I won't um, uh, describe what it is, but you have a picture here of um, repeated barycentric subdivisions of a, win, a one simplex and of uh, a two simplex. Uh, so basically, barycentric subdivisions uh, shrink, reduces the size of the simplices. Um, so let me give you a proof of that theorem um, that will be useful for you later. Uh, we have a map F uh, between two uh, geometric realizations of simplicial complexes. Uh, and though the first simplicial complex with a metric, right? And I will define a cover of K as follows. I take the pre-images of the open stars of the vertices of uh, L, right? This is an open cover, and I can consider it's a Lebesgue number. 
uh, Lebesgue number for discover is uh, real number epsilon such that for every point in K, you can find an element of the cover that contains the ball around X uh, of radius epsilon. That exists uh, since K is compact. And now you can see that the map F uh, satisfies the star condition if we have another uh, criterion, the diameter of the closed stars of the vertices of k must be smaller than epsilon. You can see that uh, this implies the star condition. Now, the, these uh, stars may be too large, hence we apply Barry-centric subdivisions, and Barry-centric subdivision uh, reduces the size of the simplices. And so at some point, you will satisfy this criterion, and you will be able to find a simplicial approximation. All right. So now we know how to uh, find simplicial equivalent equivalent to maps. So we can try to uh, triangulate the mapping cone. Um, so I recall the definition of the mapping cylinder and the mapping cone. I consider a map F between K and L. And here, K is a circle, and L is a circle too. So we will do that in three steps. First, find a simplicial approximation of the map F, all right? So say that K and L are uh, triangles. You may have to subdivide the domain uh, to find a simplicial approximation. Once you have uh, G, we will uh, triangulate the cylinder. So I have to triangulate K times 0, 1, right? And then I will glue the codomain at the end, as we did in the definition of the, uh, the cylinder. And then to obtain the, the cone, I just add a new point, and I cone the left part of the cylinder at this point. Uh, so this works. Uh, I should maybe be more, be more precise on the second point, because uh, we have to be careful um, about that how to triangulate the product of k and 0, 1. Um, so I guess uh, um, in the literature, the first instance of that, of triangulation of mapping cylinders, uh, goes back to Whitehead. And uh, he proposed uh, uh, this triangulation. So this is a three-layered uh, uh, simplicial complex. You take k, you take the barycentric subdivision of k, and you take k again. And then there is a nice way to put simplices in between so that you have a triangulation of the product. Uh, then Cohen does the same just by removing, but he removes the inner k. Uh, but we will do some, uh, something different because um, I don't want to use the uh, barycentric subdivision of k in practice because. Uh, Computationally, this is very expensive. Uh, actually, you can find the triangulation of the product with only two copies of K, and you can understand that as the product in the simplicial uh, set category. Um, I won't uh, read the definition, but um, the idea, I mean, um, an important thing here is that to obtain this uh, simplicial complex, uh, we have to make a choice. We have to choose an ordering of the vertices. So in some sense, this construction I use here is not canonical, uh, but it works. So we will use that. So now we have a triangulation of uh, the product. We had a simplicial map G from K to L. Um, and now we will take the inner part of the, the product, and we will identify it with L. And we get uh, something that I call the simplicial uh, mapping cylinder. Um, so we have to be careful. We have a map uh, uh, between the actual uh, mapping cylinder, the topological mapping cylinder, and the simplicial uh, mapping cylinder. But this map may not be a homomorphism. 
And uh, the problem is that when you glue L at the end, you may erase uh, simplices if the map G is not injective. Um, but it's okay for us because this map will still be a homotopy equivalence. Um, and I guess this is uh, one of the reasons why we won't get uh, triangulations of spaces at the end because of that and because also of the fact that the simplicial approximation uh, is only a homotopy equivalent map. Well, now we know how to triangulate mapping cylinders. And when I say that, I mean find the homotopy equivalent uh, simplicial complex. So I can sketch uh, the algorithm. I said that to build a simplicial complex, you just have to consider uh, mapping cones one by one. Uh, and now we'll do the same, but with uh, simplicial mapping cones. At each step, you will find a um, simplicial approximation of your growing map, and you will consider the corresponding simplicial uh, mapping cone. So let me give you a, a simple application of that on the projective spaces. So I define the projective spaces uh, space here. The n-dimensional uh, projective space is the quotient of the n-sphere uh, by the antipodal uh, relation. Uh, so this gives you a manifold of dimension n. For instance, uh, the RP1 is obtained from the sphere, the circle. You identify opposite points. And at the end, you can see that you get uh, a circle again. RP1 is a circle. The RP2, same thing. You identify antipodal points, uh, but you get something which is non-orientable. Um, that's RP2. Um, and actually, let me show you something. To get the pretty space, you only need to identify a hemisphere of it because the south hemisphere uh, will be glued to the north hemisphere. So you can only consider the north hemisphere and its equator. And if you glue the equator by the antipodal relation, uh, you actually obtain uh, the projective space of lower dimension. So uh, this allows to obtain a CW structure for the projective space. You take a hemisphere of the n-sphere, so this is a ball, um, and you glue it to the lower dimensional uh, projective space. Uh, this, these maps will be of uh, degree two. And so let us use this uh, description for the algorithm. I start with RP0, uh, so this is a point. Then I will uh, glue the one cell, so I glue its boundary. I have a green map from its boundary. And I obtain, at the end, RP1, a circle. Then we have to glue a two cell. Uh, so I have to find a simplicial approximation of the green map that goes from uh, the circle, the boundary of the two cell, to RP1. So I find one here after uh, four barycentric subdivisions. And as you can see, this map um, has degree two. It turns uh, twice around RP1. So I can build the simplicial mapping cone. I get a simplicial complex with 33 uh, vertices at the end. Then I want to uh, glue a three cell. And this is more complicated. So the boundary of the three cell is a sphere. I start with this triangulation of the sphere. I subdivide it. I subdivide it again. It still does not satisfy the star condition. Actually, I will have to subdivide it seven times here. And at the end, I get a mapping cone, a simple complex with a huge number of vertices. So it works, but in practice, uh, we cannot go very far. And so uh, we have to improve that algorithm a little bit. So this is the second part. And really, the, the bottleneck of this algorithm 
is the uh, simplicial approximation. So let me show you the problem. Say we want to find a simplicial approximation um, of the identity between these two triangulations of the circle. Because of these two points very close to each other in the codomain, the domain has to be subdivided many, many times. And we could have done way uh, simpler here. For instance, we could have tried to uh, subdivide k locally. I added only two red points here. Or we could have uh, simplified the codomain. Here, I contracted the little edge. So this is what I'm going to describe now. First, local subdivision. So um, there is a way to subdivide a simplicial complex holding a subcomplex fixed. Um, I won't uh, read the definition. This is called a uh, generalized subdivision. So you have a, a picture here. I want to subdivide k, the two simplex, holding this edge fixed. And I obtain that at the end. And in our case, uh, this will be useful as follows. Uh, to obtain a simplicial approximation, it is enough to subdivide the complex, holding fixed the subcomplex on which the map already satisfies the star condition. So this is much better in practice. Um, and there is something else I'd like to talk about too. Uh, Barycentric subdivision in practice is very bad because it increases the number of simplices uh, drastically. This is a little experiment. I take a triangulation of the sphere, S2. So I start with the boundary of the three simplex and I subdivide it. So you can see that the quality of the triangulation uh, is better, um, gets better, but the number of vertices explodes, right? We can use a smaller uh, structure here, which is called edgewise uh, subdivisions. So you replace a triangle with four triangles, and you only double the number of points. And as you can see in this experiment, if I apply a repeated edgewise subdivisions, at the end, I have the same quality of um, the triangulation with way few vertices. So we'll use that in practice. Um, and there is also a way to define edgewise subdivision for uh, simplices of dimension uh, three. You can subdivide a tetrahedron into eight tetrahedra. Uh, I, I guess this generalizes, generalizes to higher dimension uh, but we won't need that. Um, and still the same experiment, I compare uh, the barycentric and the edgewise subdivisions of the triangulation of the three sphere. So this, the difference is less clear, but this is still better to use edgewise uh, subdivisions. All right, uh, let's talk about contractions now. Uh, so remember the proof of the simplicial approximation theorem, uh, we had a map and we built a cover of K uh, with the pre-images of the stars of the vertices of L. And uh, epsilon was the Lebesgue number of the cover. And we said that the map satisfies the star condition if the diameter of its stars are small enough. One thing we could do is to replace uh, the domain, the codomain L, with uh, simpler, simplicial complex L prime. So I suppose that I have uh, a simplicial map G from L to L prime. Uh, so now I have a map from K to L prime, and I can consider the new cover, um, same definition as before. I uh, pull back the stars of L prime, and I may hope for this uh, Lebesgue number of this cover to be smaller. And so what we do in practice to simplify uh, simplicial complexes is edge contractions. Uh, an edge contraction is a simplicial comp in a simplicial complex is simply replacing an edge with a point. So for instance, here, 
I replace this red edge with this point. Uh, you can do that for any dimension, any edge. Uh, for instance, here, if I uh, contract this edge, I obtain that triangle. And as you see, uh, the contraction erased the simplex. Uh, and actually, if you want to um, conserve the homotopy type of your simplicial complex, you cannot contract any edge. There is a nice criterion um, that tells you which edges can be contracted. And this is called the link condition. This can be computed in, in, in practice. So let me show you something. Uh, this on the left will be a triangulation of the circle, right? And I represent the prime edges of uh, the star of W here and the prime edges of all the stars of the vertices. On the right, I consider the contraction of this uh, simplicial complex. I contracted uh, four edges. So we can use the contraction map to push uh, back, pull back stars and obtain that. And uh, look at this cover at the end. There is something interesting. The cover may be uh, uh, made of larger uh, elements. This cover still has a small Lebesgue number, right? As you can see here. And actually, this is because of uh, the map we are using, the contraction map. Uh, we could have done better uh, with using um, a homomorphism from L to the contracted complex. And this is much more uh, difficult. So uh, in this paper, uh, they call that local unfolding. And we know how to do that uh, for simple complexes of dimension two or some uh, of dimension three. Though I won't use that in the remaining of the talk. I will only use the contraction map. And as a remark, I use uh, in practice the skeleton blocker uh, structure that allows to contract very huge uh, simplicial complexes. All right. There is a last um, technical point I'd like to address. So we need a simplicial approximation, right? So this is the same drawing as before. The condition is image of the stars is contained in a star. But in practice, you cannot verify this condition because uh, it will require an infinite number of, of computations because the star contains an infinite number of points. So I propose something uh, weaker, which is called the weak star condition. You will only uh, ask for the vertices of the stars if you take their image to be included in an, uh, a star, an open star at the end. Um, <clears throat> so this is a drawing here where you can see that the vertices here of the star, well, are contained in an open star. And as for simple. W, right? And you can show that um, this is an example of... Uh, uh, Raphael, I think your connection dropped during one or two minutes. Uh, oh. So if you could backtrack maybe one slide, then I think... Oh, sorry, where, where was I? Just at the previous slide or something like that. Uh, yeah, you were explaining this weak star condition. All right, sorry. So let me start again. Um, in practice, what we will use is the weak star condition, right? Uh, you have this condition. Um, the image of the vertices of the closed stars 
must be included in some star in the codomain. If this is the case, if the map satisfies the weak star condition, uh, you can ask for simplicial approximations, define a weak simplicial approximation. For any vertex V of K, choose a vertex W as here. And uh, such a weak simplicial approximation, you can show that it is a simplicial map. Um, and there is another result. If the initial simplicial complex K is fine enough, if it is subdivised enough, then a weak simplicial approximations are simplicial approximations. These notions coincide. So this is what we'll use uh, in practice. There is uh, um, a last idea, idea I would like to share. Uh, this is a map from um, two simplicial complexes uh, that satisfies the star condition that does not satisfy the star condition, but satisfies the weak star condition. You can see here this star uh, is very large, and you cannot fit it into a star in the codomain. Though the vertices fit, uh, fit in the star of W here. Um, so it is not uh, a, a simple approximation, though the weak simplicial approximation we will get still is a homotopy equivalent to the map F, right? You can see that. Um, and I guess we can try to uh, um, prove something different for that uh, using the idea that closed maps are homotopic between uh, spaces. Um, and though L with a, a norm, a distance, and um, consider the infinite norm between maps uh, between K and L, right? Um, define epsilon uh, to be a real number such that if two maps are epsilon close in a infinite distance, uh, then they are homotopic. Uh, that may not exist in practice uh, in some cases, but I guess in some cases it exists. That will give us another uh, criterion uh, for a simple approximation, we will look simply for a simplicial map that is close to the original, to the initial map in infinite uh, distance. And I guess, but I did not go far in that direction, uh, we could try to relate this epsilon with uh, the injectivity radius of L if it were endowed with a Riemannian metric. Well. So this is it for the technical details. Um, let me show you uh, how it goes now. This was our last experiment. We had a RP3 pretty space with a lot of vertices. Now we do the same with local subdivisions, edgewise subdivisions, and edge contractions. And as you can see at the end, you obtain a much smaller uh, simplicial complex. And you can even contract it the last time uh, to obtain an RP3 with 89 vertices. All right. Uh, so I guess I will skip um, on the lens spaces and talk directly about the Grassmannian. Um, so what is uh, this object? G2 of R4 can be understood as a set of planes in R4. All right. Uh, and you can give that set uh, a topology, a smooth uh, manifold structure, and it, it is at the end a manifold of dimension four. It has uh, interesting cohomology groups, as you can see. Um, so let me explain how we can understand uh, this space. Consider a point in the Grassmannian, that is a plane in R4. Uh, choose a basis of that plane and put it in a matrix, right? So this matrix defines my plane. And what I can do is reduce this matrix into what is called a orthogonal reduced echelon form, um, simply by means of elementary operations. And this uh, reduced matrix uh, satisfy four conditions. The rows must be of norm one. 
the rows must be uh, orthogonal, and the last non-zero entry of each row must be positive. If you impose this, if you impose these four conditions, then uh, the uh, reduced form is unique. So say we have a plane, uh, and we reduced its matrix in re uh, reduced echelon form. I define two integers, i and j. Uh, i is the uh, index of the last non-zero entry of the first row, and j the index of the last non-zero entry of the second row. And this uh, two integers, i, j, is called the Schubert symbol of the plane T. And uh, you can see that um, planes in R4 may admit uh, there are six uh, possible Schubert symbols, all right? To each plane corresponds a unique Schubert symbol. And actually, this gives you a partition of the Grassmannian, right? If you uh, select a Schubert symbol and you consider all the planes that have this Schubert symbol, this is a set. And you can show that the collection of uh, such sets gives a CW structure on the Grassmannian. At the end, we have one cell of dimension 0, one cell of dimension 1, two cells of dimension 2, one cell of dimension 3, and one of dimension 4. And uh, if you work a little bit, you can find the explicit uh, formulas for the growing mass. So we can fit that to the algorithm and obtain a triangulation of uh, the Grassmannian. Uh, actually, if you do that as it is, you will get a simple complex with uh, millions of vertices. Um, and this simple complex, I have not been able to reduce it uh, with uh, edge contractions because it was too big for my computer. So uh, I helped a little bit the algorithm. I designed myself the first uh, gluing maps, the first simple approximations. Um, so I have a vertex. I glue a segment, an interval. I glue two cells of dimension two. I glue a three cell. And the last cell, I ask the algorithm to find the simple approximation and to glue the four cell. And at the end, I obtain uh, a simple complex with this number of vertices, which can be reduced to uh, this number of vertices. And that will be uh, a simple complex homotopy equivalent to the Grassmannian, G2 of R4. And uh, this is the last slide. So this is an illustration I like. Um, when you want to glue the last cell, you have to find a simple approximation from the three sphere to the three cell. And if you embed um, this triangulation of the three sphere into your uh, skeleton, into your space, you obtain this uh, drawing. And this is the end. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, we have time for maybe one very quick question. Um, it's hard for me to see if somebody is walking towards the podium. Maybe Clément is, OK? Uh, yeah, thanks, Raphael, for the very interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, uh, when you define this metric on your space that uh, directs the subdivision, uh, well, first, is there an automatic way to do this? And, uh, and maybe can you optimize the metric itself in order to, well, end up in a better setting where fewer subdivisions would be enough. You mean in the um, theoretic proof of the simple approximation theorem or in practice when I use the algorithm? Uh, well, uh, actually, if you can design a bound in the approximation theorem, that would be fantastic. And, uh, and also in practice, if you optimize with some kind of, I don't know, um, um, like optimization of the function. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is something I like to, to do because uh, it's very dumb, simple approximation, or in general, division. Um, so what I have is a triangulation of the sphere that I see in Rn. Um, and when I subdivide my simplices, I simply take the barycenter of the simplices. Um, we could try to 
think of something uh, smarter by selecting nice places for the vertices. Uh, but I did not do that. But yeah, that would be a nice uh, idea. OK, thanks. OK, thank you. So let's thank the speaker again.